Okay, it seems that in this video I'm going to have to uh, open with uh, asking you to please comment, like, and subscribe if you can. That would greatly help me. Uh, you have no idea. So now, of course, this video is not about the romanticized meaning of the one for me that some couples would profess in their love letters. I think we can define the term of the one as the short term for two main meanings, a chosen one or the foretold one. There is no exception in which the arrival of the one is not either foretold or chosen. Let's say the role of the one is predicted, but sometimes the person or persons to occupy the role are not preset. Let's now discuss the concept of prophecies. A prophecy is essentially a story that is set in the future and accepted as fact, as something that will inevitably come to pass, or at least that will come to pass unless another prophecy overrides that future. That's when the prophecy of the one can stop, for example, the end of the world. So what means the end of the world? We have many different end of the world scenarios. We can classify them in different categories and each has different levels of severity. They can all accommodate to different the one types too. According to Judeo-Christian tradition, the apocalypse or Armageddon arrives as a consequence of certain portents happening. Four horsemen are harbingers of a slew of calamities, culminating in a tragic war between heaven and hell and the end of everything. That's it, no more world. And since this scenario tends to come from a religious point of view, who knows what it really means? Could be the end of faith, could be the end of that religion itself, it could be the end of mankind, the world, the cosmos. We could have a natural disaster that would get rid of us like we are a bunch of fleas. There was an incident a bunch of thousands of years ago with a volcano that is screwed up the atmosphere so much there were about a thousand of us left. Think about it. I went to see the Guns N' Roses once and the stadium could feed 65,000 people. Imagine sitting there in the same spot and have 64,000 less people. And that's it, in the whole world. That's all you have left. We don't even know how lucky we are to be here. We've been through some shit. Now we have the apocalypse scenarios. There are many of them. We have, for example, the zombies and vampires apocalypse. I don't even need to give you examples in media or video games where zombies are a thing and there are very few humans left, but The Walking Dead comes to mind. In the case of vampires, we have I Am Legend or Daybreakers. In these cases, the fight goes to finding a cure to either immunize those who are left or revert the effects of the virus or curse on those currently affected. Nuclear war is just horrible. Plausible? nonsensical and absolutely irreversible. Radiation would dissipate after a while, but the effects on the fauna, including us, and some of the flora, the bacteria, etc., all would be sent to chaos in ways no scientists who have been able to predict. Energy crisis, this is a funny one. Have you guys seen Mad Max? So what happens when the world runs out of fossil fuels and there is no infrastructure to replace it? I know we have electric cars now, all over the place, but even now, if we run out of gas, we would end up in the same conundrum. Well, we have been recently experiencing just a glimpse of it, and it was hell. Alien or kaiju attacks. Earth flattened. We are turned into confetti. Next. War against the machines. We have seen these in the Terminator franchise and in the Matrix franchise, among many others. It is a war against our own creations. Some have gone total philosophical, like in Battlestar Galactica. It also exists in the Warhammer 40k universe, called the war against the men of iron. Except by the time we reach the current timeline, it is far behind us. Which is why the use of AI is punishable by death, it's pure heresy. Imagine conquering most of the Milky Way, just to be plunged into a war, and have all the supply chain and infrastructure among the planets be cut for 5,000 years. It is what was called the Age of Strife. Cosmic End. Now, this one is brief. Either the planet gets squished or we get devoured by aliens. That's it. Nothing is left. Swift and inevitable. And now we are left with what I call Sauron's vision. This is a scenario in which the world as we know it is over, but things carry on as normal. 
Like, some natural destruction may happen, but we are left still with a chance to fight back. In The Lord of the Rings, Sauron doesn't really want to destroy the world. He doesn't want to destroy Middle-earth, but to twist it to its own desires, just like his previous master, Melkor, aka Morgoth. In this case, the music of the Ainur, or the Ainulindale, serves as the prophecy for things to come. Ragnarok is a very unstoppable end of all gods of Valhalla, in a war between the gods and the giants. In the poetic era, it is very hard to define good and evil, but you can define the bad and the worse. After Thor and Jormungard killed each other, and Odin is devoured by Fenrir the Wolf, after he diligently also devours the sun. That's supposed to be the end of everything, but it is not. It is the end and the beginning. And this was a myth very tightly related to the seasons of the year. The trees need to die in order for winter to come. And then spring comes back for the time of sowing and waiting for the time of the harvest. So in a way, Ragnarok keeps happening over and over again. Since we're talking about myths and religions, let's talk about the Christian tradition and the one. So definitely we're not talking about Jesus. Jesus Christ and his purpose to save mankind from his own sins were not foretold. He was foretold, however, to the three wise men as the king of kings and to King Herod as the king that will replace him. So his biggest role as savior of humanity was a plan that God had all along, but it was not passed to humanity itself. Now the second coming of Christ is a totally different thing. Also, God was very good at picking an individual, bestowing something on them, and then announcing that that was going to happen to them for the rest of their days. But that was a bit of a bummer rather than a prophecy. Hence why Cain makes such a good candidate to be the first of the vampires, according to the publications of White Wolf in their RPG Vampire the Masquerade. When it came to getting woes coming from God, I would say he pretty much broke the piñata. When we start watching The Matrix, we encounter Neo as an office worker who is also a hacker in his free time. Morpheus knows the prophecy about the one and believes blindly that Neo is the one foretold. When Neo is taken to see the Oracle, she tells him that he is not the chosen one. In the end, the whole concept will be summarized as follows. What we know of our future could impact our present, hence changing our future. So, in the end, no matter what, the real prophecy, not the one revealed to us, comes to pass. It is inevitable. It is funny, like in Ragnarok, that in the following movies we are told that Neo being the one and going to talk to the architect has happened numerous times before. Some chosen ones are not chosen by prophecies or people, but by magic items. There is a placeholder for them, and the only foretold element is who is going to wield or possess the item in question. Thor, for example. This is a confusing one, since Thor saw his hammer being forced in Uru by Brock and Aitri. Yet, in the Marvel comics, it is the hammer that chooses Thor. And considering the people who have been writing Thor in the last decade or so, the hammer has been behaving like a bitchy girlfriend. Talk about why people don't read this stuff anymore. No, Heman. The power that Heman holds and makes him the savior of Eternia is the sword of power. I have the power only gets announced when he lifts the sword. There are a few episodes when he is not in its possession and then someone else has the power or nobody else does. He's not foretold, but he's definitely chosen. How can we not mention Arthur? King Arthur is definitely foretold and chosen, and he is the only one that can pull Excalibur from the stone. Only the true king will be able to pull the sword from the stone. But the sword in the stone is there for anybody to try their luck. So Arthur himself is not foretold. He is, however, the son of Uther Pendragon. So the sword was going to choose him anyway. Is he saving the world in the end? Not really, but he comes to the realization that the king and himself are one. So to impart this lesson to all other kings to come. It doesn't happen as often, but sometimes there is a prophecy that foretells about a group of people rather than an individual. There are many cases in which this trope, for example, makes me roll my eyes. Let's look at some. In Triumph's MMO Rift, we have the Ascended, mystically enhanced people who are sent from the past 
to fix the future. As this is an MMO, the sense of being anything special is highly diluted. This game came with a lot of really neat stuff, but the whole ascended trope make no difference in the narrative of the story, unless you want to justify why you keep respawning after every death. Age of Sigmar Soulbound. I was looking for an Age of Sigmar TTRPG when I came across this. I am a fan of the Warhammer TTRPG, you know, the classic one, and I wanted something that had nothing to do with the old world or post old world. In the end, I ended up getting Swihander. When I looked at the premise of Soulbound, I realized the fact that the player characters all have been Soulbound, hence the name. It is just an excuse to make them collaborate. They are all linked to each other. I didn't read much further, but it sounded like no other game mechanic was taking advantage of this fact. It felt like of all the other fantasy TTRPGs out there, this one was forcing something in the players. It's a shame, as I have plenty of Age of Sigmar armies to pull models from. Divinity Original Scene 2. You find out after a few hours of gameplay that you are some sort of special soul, not just some somewhat magical being for which you were previously imprisoned. Again, another way to stick all the players together. Baldur's Gate 3. In this case, same mechanic as in the two previously described cases, except this time it's not a blessing, but a curse. You have been infected by a parasite. Look, I love the Baldur's Gate franchise, and as I have described in one of my videos before, it is a total masterpiece. But the fact that they try to intertwine the character's narrative like this makes me sigh a little. Also, considering that both Divinity 2 and Baldur's Gate 3 are from the same developer is a little bit cringy. Again, I love Larian. I'm just a little bit cranky about this. Now, how would I, for example, put together a group of chosen ones in story the right way, or at least the way I think is the right way. So there is one way to reveal the group of chosen ones that is not cringy. You reveal it at the end, or almost at the end. In the TV show Metalocalypse, Death Clock are a bunch of brickheads that only are good at playing music and nothing else. They are absolute useless and any other life skills and that brings a lot of the hilarity, uh, a lot of the comical situations that we find so endearing. They have, however, an amazing manager who gives it all for that. And there is an underlying mystical storyline to which our protagonists are oblivious of. It is only in the last episode that they become aware of their power and their purpose to stop evil. What a ride. What amazing songs. Now we're going to walk into spoiler territory so you can jump further to this point of the video uh, if you don't want to have any spoilers because we're gonna start talking about the cabin of the woods. Ready? Go! In Josh Whedon's The Cabin of the Woods, again the protagonists of this story were chosen once, except as sacrifices to the Elder Gods, and they only find out towards the end. Even you as the audience, if you don't pay attention the first time around, will miss the clues. In this case, it is their stereotypes that mark them for sacrifice. I cannot stress how much I love this movie. I love it to bits. Talk about the really good surprises when sitting to watch a movie. Now there is a type of chosen one that I would like to call the absolute one. In the universe of Warhammer 40,000, there are several legends about how the emperor of mankind came to exist. Some speculate, that he is one of the few surviving old ones from the war in heaven, but that theory gets quickly dismissed. Games Workshop knows very well that they, what they are doing when keeping things somewhat vague for the community. Forums are always on fire with this kind of thing, but I digress. The most commonly accepted theory is that about a hundred and something thousand years ago, a bunch of prehistorical shamans prophesied the end of the world very, very far in the future. They needed a chosen one, a champion. So they performed a ceremony in which most of the powerful ones self-sacrifice at the same time to let all of their souls converge into a supreme being. This being would be the emperor of mankind, but he would remain hidden, immortal, through the ages, until the time is ready. He should be alive now, according to that narrative. When the war with the Men of Iron, the scenario I described before, happened, mankind entered the Age of Strife, which motivated the Emperor to finally come forth. Not much is known, 
of him his personal life only that he's established in his palace of the himalayas and that he is from anatolia he is not only undefeatable in combat but he's also the most powerful psyker mankind has ever produced an unparalleled scientist he had everything he needed in order to unify humanity and give them a brighter future this level of power is not just there to save the world but also to conquer and prosper one could say he is godlike, and after his fall to his son Horus and the church of the emperor was established, he seems more real than ever. Now we have a different type of absolute one that is in intentionally or unintentionally foretold. The case with Paul Atreides from the Dune franchise is a weird one, since the possibility of the Kwisatz Haderach being born was foretold by the Bene Gesserit, but had no timeline. It was a very strong possibility that it would be the son of Duke Leto Atreides and that's why Paul's mother was forbidden from conceiving a male. See, what makes Paul special is that while all Bene Gesserit are female and have mental powers, they can trace all their female lineage from the beginning of the species. Paul can trace both male and female lineages giving him an absolute perspective. It is very interesting that he came to be, but could have been avoided or delayed. Now, let's look at the case of having a supreme beam, but one that is not the one. So sometimes we have an absolute unit of a character that is super powerful, runs galactic empires, and yet it's not a chosen one. I present to you Emperor Palpatine. There's only one thing that keeps him back from being the one. I'm being very impartial here, not taking sides with good or evil. Palpatine is neither chosen nor foretold. He's just some powerful Sith that never stopped growing in power and influence. He pitted rivals and allies against each other just to make sure none were stronger than him. That's how he ended as a head of the Empire. Now, how the abominations that are the sequel movies by Disney portrayed him in the end? Well, I have decided those movies are fan fiction, so they don't count. Now, there is something I call the tragic ones. In the universe of Andrei Sarkovsky's Witcher series, we have Siri. She was born with elder blood and caused her to have enormous amounts of power. She is more a conduit than a wielder. She knows magic to an extent and learns to control that, but sometimes she just goes haywire and almost kills everyone around her several times, both in the books and the video games. I refuse to acknowledge anything past season one of the Netflix show. You know, do you remember when Geralt was still important in his own show? She never realizes that massive power into changing the status quo into a positive way, but she's a chosen one nonetheless. Anakin Skywalker. Do you remember when Obi-Wan Kenobi meets Anakin in Mustafar for the famous duel? Do you remember what Obi-Wan yells at him? You were the chosen one! It was said that you would destroy the Sith, not join them! You were to bring balance to the Force, not leave it in darkness. I guess this statement was right. It came to be when, after his duel with Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader grabs the Emperor and yeets him down the power exhaust. That's it. Destiny fulfilled. Redemption. But I guess we can have nice things, can we? And then they couldn't just leave the Emperor alone, could they? More money, let's spray paint the Mona Lisa if we think we can have a couple more bucks since we're at it. Now think about this dude. White long hair, strange eyes, drinks potions to prepare for combat, knows alchemy, very good in combat. The White Wolf. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Elric of Melnibone. And the whole series of novels is tragic. So how not, our protagonist has to be the most tragic of them all. He was born the Prince of Melnibon, uh, being born albino, killed his mother at birth, foretold to bring down not just his whole royal house, but also the Melnibonian Empire, that also bring the end of the world. It was told that he was going to blow the horn of destiny and bring with it the end of all things. Just after having everybody he loved die 
by his hand. The whole series of books makes you love the character and the world. And also, sometimes, face palm yourself so hard that your hand will leave a mark at the back of your head. He just goes with it if the gods of chaos play him even a little too hard. Now we have the self-imposed burden. Some chosen ones are not foretold, but they choose themselves. Frodo, yes, we're going Lord of the Rings again. In this case, the hardest decision for Frodo was to carry the ring, as he was going to be the most appropriate person to carry it. He's not impervious to its power, but definitely more resistant to it than others. That comes from his Hobbit heritage, as they are way more empathetic than humans, elves, or dwarves. It shows us that knowing the importance of letting the world in the hands of Sauron would condemn everyone around him. I always say that the main trait of a hero is their willingness to sacrifice everything for people they don't even know. And Frodo does exactly this. He self-imposes the burden of the ring to save others. That's how he becomes the one. He is the ring bearer. So what happens when you are destined to be the one not to be the one? Let me explain. What happens when you are the one but not the protagonist of the story? So there was this movie that I saw some time ago with a very good cast. It's not very well known. It has Kevin Bacon, Liv Tyler and Rain Wilson. Yes, Dwight from The Office. He plays a guy that turns superhero without having superpowers. Kind of like a key cast scenario just a suit and hits people over the head with a wrench. He's not the chosen one, but hear me out. At the end of the movie, he understands that he becoming a hero and do something somewhat heroic was not for him to be a protagonist. The person he rescues becomes the important one. He's an instrument for someone else's success. And that is something that once you're okay with, makes you understand that your purpose is definitely making the world a better place, but maybe not by your hand. In Cyberpunk Netrunners, in this case we have David Martinez trying to make something for himself before Night City chews him alive. He understands that he is meant to perish. Shine bright and die young, they say. Go with a bank and they will name a cocktail after you of the afterlife. In the end, he sacrifices for Lucy's dream. He's been told before that he has lived for someone else's dream always. His mother's, Lucy's. He just happens to embrace it towards the end, and once he understands this, it makes him accept his death with a smile. In conclusion, you know, most of the one characters tend to have a tragic end. Just wait enough and you'll see. Some like Frodo go and retire to the west in Valinor. Neo gets cuddled and honored by the machines he so fiercely fought. Darth Vader dies after being fried by the Emperor. Elric accepts his destiny and ends it all, and you will see what happens to Paul Atreides if you keep watching. I don't like the trope of the one in gaming. I like watching it, I like reading it, plays, movies, as long as it's interesting, it's good. I just don't like it in gaming, because in gaming, it's there for the sake of adding a meaningless spotlight. It's not someone's birthday. I really enjoyed Skyrim through and through, but the fact that you are the Dova King kind of spoiled it a little bit for me. I would have rather liked to be some random dude. This is way more relatable. Or not to be infected in Baldur's Gate 3, but just make friends along the way and find some other motivation to stop the evil dude. We are meant to change the world, contribute. Like David Martinez, we are the right person with the right purpose that nobody can fulfill. In many ways, we are all the one. And since we are all special, nobody is. And that's okay. In the end, we can all be a bit like Frodo. In the end, we can all have a King Telus, my friend, you bow to no one. We're all the one, and we are moving the world forward together, even if we weren't chosen or foretold. Remember, even the smallest person can change the course of history. Thank you for watching. Oh, and subscribe, subscribe.